open our textbooks to chapter six. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Welcome to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and educator attempting to provide you the best in our historical content. So follow along, much appreciated to my past, present, and future subscribers. I'll try to deliver the best content possible. Am I hallucinating here? Just what in the hell do you think you're doing? So in this episode, as you know, because you clicked on the video, we're going to talk about Gene Tingling. An artist who has done all kinds of crazy things, and I hope you'll be on your edge of your seat for this one. So, kick off your shoes, get relaxed, get comfy. Here we go. Gene Dingley. When examining the life of an artist, we really never know what's going to make that artist click in terms of their motivation and inspiration. And with the artist Gene Tingley, the thing that really made him click as an artist was an exposure once he had discovered the Dada works of Kurt Schwitters. These works would have a profound influence on his future constructions. After a brief stint as a surrealist painter, he would abandon painting in favor of sculpture. He got his first art training at the School of Arts and Crafts in Switzerland, and soon, like most artists of his day, Tingley moved to Paris along with his wife. His first wife, Ava Eipley, was a Swiss artist. She began her art career as a painter and progressively became more interested in sculpting, figurines in textile, and in bronze. They arrived in October of 1952 and quickly became friends with the influential Parisian artists like Yves Klein and Niki de saint Fali. But the art market is really crazy now. I'd love to see this. He would have his first Parisian show in May of 54, primarily showing his works of his relief-type sculptures. A lot of his work at that time was being made of scrap metal and found objects that were largely painted in uniform black. Now, his work would soon evolve into more machine-like sculptures. He called them metamatics, and these machine-like sculptures were his neo-dada-like ideas and his beginning to explore the ideas of kinetic sculpture that very much rooted in his belief that humanity's reliance on technology was so absurd he, he just had to make artwork that uh, revolted against that. We may in that line of metamatics, he would make a unique series of drafting machines that would produce abstract pieces of artwork. The most prominent in this series was Metamatic 17, which combined sculpture, painting, mechanization, sound, drama, and dance to produce a machine that would create 40,000 abstract paintings in a three-week span of time. This was an electric-powered machine that was very much taking a jab at popular abstract painters, in particular Jackson Pollock. He felt that he could make a machine that could be as productive, if not more productive, and make even better pieces of artwork than even Jackson Pollock could do. And he very much did not have a lot of respect for the artwork being produced by Jackson Pollock. Anyway. Although Metamatic 17 was created as a working artwork, many of his other pieces in the series were actually functionless, but gave the appearance of doing work. Again, going back to his idea that humanity is too reliant on machines. I warned you, but did you listen to me? Oh, no, you knew it all, didn't you? Throughout Tingley's career, he was known for many works. Probably his most notorious work was Homage to New York. And this piece was unleashed on the Museum of Modern Art in New York in March of 1960. This object event type machine was set up in the sculpture garden and unveiled in a very formal event. Guests would come out to the garden not really knowing what to expect with this particular work. There is probably nothing that would have prepared them for the shock that they would be witnessing on this particular evening. Homage to New York was designed 
to self-destruct. This work began to move and tear itself apart, and in the conclusion it would be detonated and explode. As the work would smolder and smoke and be on fire, Gene Teeley went to the front of the crowd and said, Who gives a damn about art? And walked away. Now surprisingly, this was not an original concept. Gene Tingley actually took the idea from another artwork called Optical Device. Side note, Optical Device was made in 1920 by the artists Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray. They designed a self-destructive artwork that was powered by a machine gasoline engine that they had acquired from a lawnmower and the cutting blades were utilized to chop itself apart. As a trial run, they created the sculpture and started it up and it began to destroy itself as designed and chunks of it began flying around the studio. A snap piece of metal flew through the air and lodging in the wall, narrowly missing Man Ray, who would have more than likely been killed by that lawnmower blade just inches from his head. Duchamp and Man Ray felt that this work was so dangerous that they vowed never to work together again for fear that one of them would imminently be killed by their next venture together. However, this work did inspire Tingley to create homage to New York. What the hell am I looking at? After a divorce in 1960, Gene Tingley would get into a long relationship with French artist and his collaborative partner, Nicky de saint Fali. It came 1950, 50, my studio in Paris, <coughs> and uh, she saw a relief who was white and black, white forms and black behind, black uh, background. Quite uh, noises. Forms. Huh? And yeah. you told me, why do I, why you don't put feathers on that? Remember? Mm -hmm. And I was very mad about this about. Yes, he was furious for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then when he wasn't any furious anymore, we saw each other again and we started living together. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. And he put feathers? Yes. And I put feather right away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, snappy. Oh, bird. <sighs> and the two would get married on July 13th, 1961. Although they worked independently as artists, they would also work in collaboration. Now, the most important of their collaborative works was homage to Stravinsky or Stravinsky's Fountain, which is located right next to the Pompidou Center in Paris, France. Now, a while back, I made a video where I used videos and photo that I captured while in Paris that is all set to the music Firebird, which is the ballet that this was actually inspired by. And I'll put a link down below if you want to check that out. But... This fun-filled fountain is built up of 16 separate sculptures that were inspired by the famed Russian musician Igor Stravinsky's compositions and, as I mentioned there, his ballet The Firebird from 1910. But the work very much fuses her fun-filled, colorful sculpture and design with his animation and metalwork. Now, the pair would continue to make various works over the years, and again, they both worked independently and collaboratively moving forward. You know, 40 years of cigarette smoking really did some wear and tear on his body. He went into this coma and apparently from the story, he woke up and he could just smell smoke. And at that time where they were living, they had a neighbor whose barn had caught on fire, killing numerous animals that were inside. And this would be the inspiration and the beginning of his obsession with death in his work. The idea that would root in this was a work called The Witches. This is a collection of eight motorized figures that are made from various found metal objects, wrought iron, axles, pulleys, bicycle frames, scrap, and also includes various fabric pieces and animal skulls. And it is said that a lot of these items were collected from the site of that burned down neighbor's barn. Anyway, the work itself is animated and mechanized like most of his works with electric motors. And this always reminds me of my time as a little kid, you know, growing up in the 70s, 80s. You'd go into a department store mall and they would have a big Santa Claus land in a big area. And they would have these mechanized animals and reindeer that would move around. And I was always just 
fascinated by the artistry and the setup and the motion that was created in these little sculptural areas, you know. And I could just sit there and watch and watch, and I absolutely loved this. But this is very much the same thing, except with all of that cute stuffing ripped off, and you just see the motors. To put it another way, it's kind of like... As a kid, when I got my pick of places to go to eat, I'd go to Showbiz Pizza. But, it's like going to Showbiz Pizza, except all of the gears and all of the electronics of the animated characters are exposed. Kind of a nightmare, but kind of cool at the same time. Anyway, I digress. These gruesome figures would wobble, rotate, and move in much the same fashion as I recall from my youth. Anyway... This was obviously an odd way of looking at life and death, and for Tingley, he felt that this was the cause of death to his life. Don't smoke. It doesn't make you grown up. It makes you a loser. Tingley and de saint Fali would eventually move from that country home, and they would actually move into an old bottle factory that was renovated into a home and studio space for them and the pair would work together until Tingley's death in 1991. Although suffering from declining health, it would be a heart attack that would inevitably take his life. Although gone, their spirit lives on through their artwork, their influence on kinetic art, and the ideas of a simpler life, and artists reflecting their personal beliefs in their art is very much a part of what artists do and have done forever. And in that way, their legacy lives on, their work lives on, and anytime you get an opportunity to see their works, I highly encourage you to do so because it's absolutely incredible and thought-provoking. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I love bringing it to you. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more episodes of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. We'll see you real soon. Thanks again. Use your phasers! I can't! I'm in hyperspace!